Good morning, everyone. Good to see you here joined in our morning services here at Central. It is a joy to gather together. Someday we'll be gathered together back at our normal church services at 400 Vine Street. We so look forward to doing that. Please keep that in your prayers. Meanwhile, we do observe the Lord's Supper. We'll be doing that in just a few moments, so have your emblems ready. We'll be singing a song, having a prayer. Parker will be leading us shortly, and we'll have an opportunity to study from God's Word and to give all of those important parts of our worship to the Lord. We're going to begin with a song, one about the Lord being with us. Get your hearts ready. O oh Lord, be with me then. It's a comfort for us to think about having God's presence. We're going through a lot of different struggles in our lives. Some of you are shut in in your homes. Some of you are getting out and going to work. Others just staying busy trying to put everything together and hold everything together. It's such a great thing to have the Lord with us and the blessing of getting to pray to him. We're going to pause now and have a word of prayer, and Parker Allison is going to lead us. Lord, we come to you today as one church in many homes, and as we worship in these homes, help us to worship you with an undistracted heart, mind, and body. Lord, as we continue in this time of uncharted waters, God, our leaders to make the right decisions, decisions that deepen the faith and joy of us, the body. Father, we thank you for days like today when we can continue to stay faithful regardless of our location. Be with us throughout the rest of this week. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you have your emblems ready, we'll be taking the Lord's Supper here in just a moment. You know, I thought about the occasions where we gather together in our homes and maybe one, two, or maybe, maybe a, a larger family gathered together. But uh, what a blessing it is as we think about that. We continue to remind ourselves when we take the Lord's Supper, we are still believing. We are still worshiping together, and God is still taking care of us. 
Let's have the Lord's Supper now. Good morning, everybody. Before we get started, I've got a few thoughts I would like to share uh, with everyone that has been going on in the last uh, several weeks. Um, the last several weeks have been very challenging, uh, challenging for everybody, um, whether you've been directly or indirectly affected by everything that has happened. Um, we're fortunate. Um, we're fortunate that we still have the ability to do this because of the technology age that we live in. Because of the te technology, um, you know, allows us to gather in dozens of different homes uh, to come together as one body. Um, when I talk about the craziness of the last several weeks, um, who, who would ever thought some crazy bat virus would have caused us to start doing things that we never thought we would have to do? Uh, to have church like this, uh, our day-to-day -day normal operations is completely just obliterated. It's, it's not the same. Everybody, everybody's having to do something different, uh, and it's almost different every day. Uh, but we're still fortunate that we have the opportunity to worship, to live in our faith, to love, and to have God. Um, first verse I want to read to everybody. It's going to be Romans chapter 5. Uh, verses 1 through 5. Again, that's Romans 5, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into his grace, in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured in, out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Um, perseverance, uh, hope, that seems to be two things that people really have been hitting on the last couple of months now, almost. Um, last verse, um, coming from 1 Corinthians. Uh, it's one that we've all read many times. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 uh, verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we humbly approach your throne to say thank you. Uh, thank you for the blessings you have given us uh, through the past weeks, months. Uh, thank you for what may, what is still to come. Uh, thank you for your son, um, who willingly came down to this earth and knew that he was going to die a cruel death, uh, but did it anyway so we may have remission of our sins and hope for eternal life. As we take of this bread, as it resembles his body, uh, may we all have do so in a manner that's well-pleasing to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's uh, continue with the communion. Heavenly Father, we continue in a likewise manner with the fruit of the vine that represents the blood that was shed uh, by your Son. Uh, over the next few moments, may we all take our hearts and our minds back to that time and place uh, that was such a cruel experience um, for the first century Christians. May we Put our hearts and minds uh, in a respectful place at this moment. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We come to a part of the our service now where we, we partake of the offering. Um, whether you do it by mail and check, online, if you want to drop your check off with somebody, uh, however you feel like you need to do it, uh, do, do so with a cheerful heart. Uh, 
it's because of you and your generosity uh, that we're able to continue to do things here at Central. And we look forward to being able to do even more once we get back together. Uh, so let's go to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we humbly approach your throne again. Uh, we want to acknowledge everything that we are attempting to do for you, Lord. Uh, whether it's gathering in dozens of different homes uh, to continue to still be one body, uh, whether it's you know, deciding dates uh, when we can all gather as one body in one place. Uh, but we also want to say thank you that we are able to do so uh, without persecution at this time. We're thankful that we have the leaders that we do with Central uh, that decide on what directions we need to go. We're thankful for all the missionary work that we have, um, that it is still continuing in different ways that we never thought would happen. Lord, we just want to say thank you for the blessings and that we are ever so dearly in love with you and thankful for your love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Chris talked about the blessings that we have. And you may not feel that way sometimes, but we are extremely blessed people in so many different ways. I saw pictures of the brethren meeting together in Nicaragua. And when I was talking with them on the phone just this past week, they were meeting at a midweek service. Last Sunday, I talked with them on the phone. I saw pictures also from India with Surrey and his people bowed down, bent over to the floor, praising God, pictures of them taking the Lord's Supper. And I think of how extremely blessed we still are in this world. I hope you feel that way and that you look to God and give thanks to him, and that it be a rich day for you. As I'm looking at this camera right now, I'm thinking of Central. I'm thinking of young people that sit off to one side college students and young people that are sitting in the center of the pews, those that used to gather together as we were there at worship, and all the other people scattered around the different places. And I see all these different ones in my mind, and I think how precious a body we have, how blessed we are as a people. I want to continue my lessons this morning on a study from the life of David. I've been so blessed by looking back through this life of him and learning some new things. As I mentioned earlier in a lesson a couple weeks ago before Mother's Day, that he is one of just a few characters that are mentioned in the Old Testament that have so much said about him. There are a lot of people mentioned in the Old Testament, but not as much about the story of maybe David, Moses, and a couple others. And David is surely one of those that God highlights. 990 times his name appears in the Bible. 476 times it appears in 1st and 2nd Samuel alone, those two Old Testament books. Amazing as we think about it, and here's what God is doing. He, he's putting up this picture before you and saying, look at my servant David, how great he was. And again, you might be thinking to yourself, well, I'm thinking about the story of David and Bathsheba. But God overlooked those things when David repented, forgave him of those things. So in the times to come after David's life, when other kings arose during that time, God would always use David as a measuring mark of how faithful one of his next kings would be. For instance, in 1 Kings chapter 14, verses in 7 and 8, the Lord says to the prophet, you go tell Jeroboam, that was one of the kings, that you have not been like my servant David who kept my commandments and who followed me with all his heart to do only what is right in my eyes. And again, you might think to yourself, but wait a minute, what about David and Bathsheba? And what about Uriah the Hittite that was murdered because of David's 
plotting and, and maneuvering there. But God forgave him of those sins. And because of the qualities of David and because of the relationship, God is able to ignore the things that are happened. And the outcome is gorgeous. Described in the New Testament in Acts chapter 13, verse 22, God says, this is a man after my own heart. I want that in my life. Do you want that in your life? Study the life of David. Look at the qualities that he had. Look at the relationship he built and not emulate those things and make it be what you need to be. We talked about the selection process of David being king the last time we studied. Now, as we begin this study today, I want you to remember as we're looking at this that, that God has selected David as king. In 1 Samuel 16, the discussion goes on uh, between God and, first of all, Samuel about going down and choosing this person. It's interesting that God doesn't tell Samuel, go down and anoint David. Do you ever think about that? He says, go down and I'll show you the person. And so you remember the story we talked about it a few weeks ago, and you've read it where as uh, Jesse, the father of David, begins to bring his firstborn son, the, the large, good-looking man, before Samuel, thinking this is going to be the king, uh, God, in a sense, whispers in Samuel's ear, saying, that's not the one. And so Jesse brings the next son, and that's not the one, and then the next son, and God's still saying no. And finally, after all of the sons, except for David, they're all brought through. And Jesse hasn't even thought about David. Young old David, that little boy that, that takes care of the sheep, no one ever thought of David being a king, you see. Oh, he was a good boy. Uh, he played a harp well, and he managed the sheep well, but a king? And I want to start with that idea today as we're looking at this. There are three things to highlight. Number one, I want to talk about the heart of David. I want to talk about the eyes of David, and then I want to talk about the feet of David. He was humble in heart. His eyes had a viewpoint of God and his feet always following God and his word. 1 Samuel 17, this humble heart. As David is going out uh, in, verse, in, in uh, verse Samuel 17, he's going out to a battle line. Now, it's not his battle at the moment. It's the one of Saul and his army. And you know the story about Goliath, that large giant of a man out there on the fields. And if you read the verses uh, 1 through 11, you see that, that this giant has been out there day after day after day, taunting Israel, daring anyone to come out and fight him and, and let the, the victor decide the battle rather than just armies gather together and kill lots of people. And Saul wouldn't go. His army wouldn't go. And Jesse has his three oldest sons out there in the battle, and Saul is king, and he's leading the army, but none of these people are fighting Goliath. Nobody in the army feels well enough equipped. Saul, who was considered to be head and shoulders above all the others when he was elected king, still didn't go. And you've got to ask yourself, why not? Why wasn't one of these daring enough, trusting enough of God to step out and do battle? Well, as we look at the situation in verses 17 and 18, David is sent by his father Jesse to take food to the brothers who are in the army. And so he goes out on the front lines and, and carries the food up there. Now, I want you to know what's going on. Now, watch this. If you've never seen this before, Jesse is still seeing David as little boy David. He's not looking at him as king. Now think about it. Previous to this time, Samuel has come along, God's prophet, anointed David as king, and then everything goes back to normal. David is still taking care of sheep. No one is seeing him as King David. He's the boy that's carrying food to the brothers, the big brothers, who are out in battle. The family doesn't see him this way. As he arrives on the scene and his bigger brothers are there discoursing with him, David has been tending the sheep. Now he is taking food to his brothers, who at this point 
sees him out on the battle line and starts to, to ridicule him. What are you doing out here? You just come here to see bloodshed or whatever, you know? And they're beginning to disrespect David. Pause a minute. David has been anointed king. And nobody's realizing it. Well, they, they realize it, but nobody's taking note of it. He's not given any special exalted position. The father is not looking at him saying, well, now David's king. We can't put him out there with the sheep anymore. Or we're going to send somebody else with the food out there. Or when David arrives on the battlefield, his brothers are disrespecting him. And all David can say and all he does say is, can I just speak a word? I just ask a question. Who's out there? What's going on with Goliath? And his brothers disrespect him. Humility. Humbleness of heart. I said we were going to look at the heart of David. This individual does not stand up at this moment and say, I am king. I deserve to be out here with God's people. These soldiers out here are now my soldiers. None of that appears. All David says is, can I at least say a word? Ask a question? What a humble young man he is. I want you to look at that, that attribute that is so valuable in God's people. Whether you are a leader in the church, whether you are a servant in the church, whatever you do, however you see yourself, humility is a tremendously important factor in the lives of God's people. James chapter 4, verse 10 James, the brother of our Lord Jesus, says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. And David certainly did. He was the humble-hearted individual. And eventually, God lifted him up and put him where he needed to be. I want you to see that. All right, that's humble in heart. Now we're going to talk about the eyes of God, the eyesight of God. Now, I'm questioning why the soldiers did not go and why Saul did not go. Trained and experienced men of battle, physical stature, abilities, etc., and nobody steps out in the battle. I'm looking at what's going on, and you know the story that David asks to go to battle. Saul balks at the account to start with. Then he says, okay, you can go. And he, he equips David with his sword and his shield. And it's so big and heavy for this young boy. He can't manage it. Now, I'm not, he's not a 10-year-old boy. He's probably a, a teenager at, at, at that age or whatever. Not old enough to be in the army. And, and yet, this is too much for him. And as you're looking at this, he is looking at battling Saul with the eyes of God. He says, the Lord has delivered me from the lion. The Lord has delivered me from the bear. The Lord will deliver me in battle from this Philistine. That's looking at things the way God looks at them. He doesn't examine the physical stature and compare Saul's size or, or Goliath's size rather to his size. But he examines what he is able to do with God on his side. And as you're seeing that, I want you to realize that. And the trust, of course, that he has in God delivering him. Now think about where we are in our time of day. And a command that God has given us and from the apostles on forward. In Matthew chapter 28, what is commonly called the Great Commission at the end of Matthew's gospel. To go therefore into all the world and teach the gospel. And our measuring status is, that's too big of a place. We can't do that. I'm not trained. I don't have the ability. But as Jesus is giving that command, none of the apostles balk at what's going on. But you know that they followed that command. They fulfilled what God had told them. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, just before Jesus ascends into heaven, he looks at his apostles once again. And he says, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. 
Just measure for a moment, as David might have measured his height compared to Goliath, just measure for a moment you in your little household and the world out there. Or just start with Jerusalem as the apostles were given to their first challenge. A, a throne of Jewish tradition, a, a throne of their religion, the people who had just sent Jesus to his death, and now the apostles are to go to Jerusalem. And then when they get through there, like God sees it accomplished. Then Judea, that's the larger region around. And then Samaria, that's beginning to expand to the borders. And then let's just go to the rest of the world. But the viewpoint, you see, that we ought to have is David's. And we're seeing things in God's eyes. That that world is a challenge that's there for us. They took that challenge in Acts chapter 8, verse 4. When persecution came upon the church and Saul, who was Saul at that time, was there consenting to Stephen's death. And, and those people died and then the people began to be scattered abroad. And verse 4 says in Acts chapter 8 that those who were scattered abroad went everywhere. What did they do? Lay low? Hide because of persecution? Did they think to themselves, no, I don't believe we can do this? They had the eyesight of God. They were scattered abroad and they went everywhere preaching Jesus, you see. A little later on in the book of Acts, when a group of Christians arrives in an area, it is said in a derogatory manner, but what a praise. It says, and these who have arrived here are the ones that have turned the world upside down. Imagine, turned the world upside down with the eyesight of God. That's the way we ought to be, humble in heart, have the eyesight of God. And number three, the feet that follows God. Follows God's lead. Now remember that David is king. We're going back to the life of David. We're examining what's happening. He's been anointed king. He's killed Goliath out on the battlefield. And, and as he does so, he could have turned around and said, all right, I've proven my kingship. And he doesn't do that. He doesn't push for being king, he follows still in God's direction and lets God develop the life that he had planned for David. I think he trusted in God's providence that God would be working out the anointing of David that was already done to eventually put him on the throne. But he didn't take matters into his own hands. David was still serving Saul. I want you to look at something in 1 Samuel, uh, chapter 19. As David was serving Saul, Saul and David were teamed together to fight, to fight the Philistines. When they came back from battle, here's what goes on at first battle. Now it happened as they were coming home that when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistines, that the women had come out of the cities of Israel singing and dancing, and to meet the king Saul with tambourines, with joy and instruments. And the women sang a song and danced and said, Saul has slayed his thousands and David his ten thousands. Oh my. Verse eight. And then Saul was very angry and the saying displeased him. Verse nine says, and Saul so therefore eyed David from that day forward in a bad way, of course. And it happened that on the next day, a distressing spirit from God came upon Saul and he prophesied inside the house. So David played music with one hand as with, as, with his hand as the other times. But there was a spear in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the spear for he said, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped his presence. And then down in verse 14, it says, And David behaved wisely in all the ways, and the Lord was with him. I want you to take note of what's being said here about David. He could have turned around and said, Saul, you're not king anymore. I'm supposed to be in charge. God's done this. I've proven myself. I've gone into battle with you. I've killed my ten thousands. Now, step aside. I'm up here. Just you, you messed up. And David doesn't do this. He's allowing God to develop the path. And he's going to walk that path 
in the way. He doesn't jump in and steal the throne or, or rightfully take it even in that sense. A little later on, Saul begins to reach out to kill David several times. David uh, is helped by Jonathan, who is Saul's son, ironically. And he ends up running in battle with, running from battle rather with his men, always avoiding Saul. He will never go into battle against Saul because of his kingdom that he should have, but rather he lets God develop the plan. In 1 Samuel 24, as David is hiding out from Saul with some of his men inside a cave, the scripture says that Saul goes into the first part of the cave to relieve himself. He is inside there, and David's uh, friends say, God has delivered Saul into your hands. Go up and strike him. And David doesn't do it. He says, I can't do this. I, I can't destroy the Lord's anointed. And so he tiptoes up, and he cuts the corner of Saul's robe to show how close he was. Now his plan is, and it develops, that after Saul leaves the cave, that David comes out a short distance behind him, Saul some distance away, and he holds up the corner of the, the uh, coat that Saul had, and he says, look, I could have killed you. I was this close, but I would not destroy the Lord's anointed. Verse 4 says, and David was troubled because he had cut Saul's robe. What a heart. What an incredible guy. But he's letting God work the plan out. In chapter 26 of 1 Samuel, once again, Saul turns around and he's chasing after David. Back in chapter 24, he repented of doing it. And then again, in rage, he goes after David. So his men are camped out one night in one area. And David, along with Abishai and a few other men, sneak up into Saul's camp. Goes right up to the head of Saul picks up Saul's spear stuck in the ground, gets his water jar and tiptoes out, not doing anything. Now David's good friend Abishai says, just let me take him right here. And David will not. He says, the Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. Notice, no revenge, no anger towards Saul, but still a respect. David is allowing God to, to set the pace in this. Although he knows he should be uh, king right then and, and Saul should step aside, evidently David says, God will work it out, and he does so. I want you to look at what's going on in the life of David and these three things, the heart of David, the eyes of David, and the feet of David. He has a humble heart that allows him to continue serving the Lord in a proper way. And oh, how we need that in every servant in the Lord's church, in every home, in every marriage, that we look at one another in our relationships, be it at church or at work or wherever, that we have that humbleness of heart that will allow God to lift us up. And then the eyes of David to realize we need to see things the way God sees them, to examine these obstacles out there as just mere obstacles that God will allow us to lead through and will lead us through and direct us and strengthen us through that. And then the feet to follow God's path that he's laid for us. Although David was the anointed one, he waited patiently until God allowed that to happen. Sometime down the road, I want to discuss David's sin and his repentance looking at what goes on there in the life of David and some of the things that followed, some interesting things. Think about it. And as you're looking at this, go back and read 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel and look at the life of David and ask yourself, do I have those qualities? I want to be a man after God's own heart, a man that is willing to do what God says, humble enough to allow God to develop the path, willing to follow him, trusting him all the way, that will develop a heart for God, a man after God's own heart. Let's bow in a prayer. 
Fathers, we pray this day. We ask your blessings on us to be truly your servants. We pray for humble hearts. We pray for eyes that see obstacles as, as mere opportunities with your strength to respect and honor you and serve you. And, and may our feet lead us, Father, where you want us to go. May we be mindful of that. May we follow your lead to let you develop the course and the path in our life as individuals and as a church. And may we step forth, Father, with boldness as David did and serve you well. We thank you for these moments. Please bless us, Father, in our homes. Please give us strength to continue on. Please bless our leaders as they are struggling with all the things they have of making decisions. We thank you, Lord, for them. We thank you, Father, for Jesus especially, his sacrifice on the cross. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. This week, pray for our leaders. Remember that our elders are still trying to work out a good time to bring the church together. They're concerned for each one of you as well as I am. We want to have everybody together. We want that to happen now but we want to make sure that everyone arrives safely and is able to go home safely. Pray that this virus passes. Pray that our country is put back together to where it was. Pray especially that we'll have the heart and the quality of David's. May God bless you with a wonderful week.